Welcome back to some content that you probably didn't subscribe to, or maybe you did, but I've been thinking about this for a long time. Today I wanted to give you guys an update on my life since lately YouTube has been pushing so much of my family drama, I figured why not now. As of today, I think I'm in a much better spot, mentally, physically, than I have been in a long time. And I wanted to give you some insight into my internal struggles that I've been going through and how I've been addressing my outlook on life and just how I came to these conclusions. I'd just like to tell you about what I think is just general growth for me as a person. You see, for a while after I found out about my family doing drugs and lying and stealing, I was basically numb. I had no capacity for emotion, nor did I care about anyone else's. But I would tell everyone the opposite, though. I would say, you know, I'm fine. It is what it is. Lying to myself that everything was fine, and I did what I was supposed to do in the end. Everyone said, cut contact, move away, and never look back. And it seems simple enough, right? I wish. I'd be lying if I said what happened with my family has not followed me in some form or another. It has definitely affected my ability to have relationships with everyone, but I've been working on improving that. You know, probably once a week I'll have wild, vivid dreams about my family, <laughs> the drugs, lies, all of it, and I'll wake up in a panic, just covered in hot sweats. Sometimes I'll be running errands and I'll have to go back to the area in town where a lot of this took place and I'll notice myself become restless. I'll bite my nails. I don't have any nails left. Uh, I'll scratch my head. I'll start to get general anxiety and I'm better about it now. But when I realize I'm doing it, I have to gently remind myself things aren't the way they were before. But it's just a subconscious reaction that happens purely from just being in the environment where that stuff happened. <laughs> Occasionally, I see people strung out on the street and I have to look away. You know, there's just this intrusive thought, what if it's my family? You know, but then again, I have to gently remind myself that they don't live here anymore. How could it be them? They're all just really intrusive thoughts. And I refused to admit anything for a long time. I refused to tell anyone about these things. I tried to keep it deep down. I figured it would pass. I figured it would get better with time. Just keep going. As everyone says, time heals all wounds. I hate saying that I most likely have some form of CPTSD or any of those conditions because surely those are reserved for people that have seen real life shit like combat, death. I was just lied to by people that were close to me, right? How could I be so affected by something like that? I'm not a combat vet. I haven't been to war. I haven't seen my best friends die. So it's weird to think that I have some sort of PTSD. Not in a million years did I think I would ever have issues like this. I thought I was bigger than this. These sorts of things happen to other people, not me. It could never happen to me. I have the will of an ox, the stubbornness of a donkey. You know, I'm stronger than these mental issues. You know, feelings are for kids, emotions are for pussies. You'll be stronger if you just stay numb and keep moving forward because that's what strong men do. And I was wrong, <laughs> so wrong. That is an extremely narrow-minded and immature view of things. But it wasn't to me at the time. To me, it was protection. Protection from having to face head-on what happened. Protection from having to be vulnerable again to anyone else, even HR lady. Just keep everyone at a football field's length away and I'll be fine. But what I thought was protection was suffocation. Truthfully, I didn't want to be seen as weak for acknowledging that I was struggling. And let's be honest, the internet is the first to call you a pussy if you're anything but David Goggins, you know? Men can't talk about this stuff. Um, you know, just suffer in silence, so to speak. Anyways, 
I figured I could man my way through it and deal with these nightmares and sudden flashbacks or moments of just disassociation. I thought I could deal with it by myself. I didn't need a shrink to tell me that something was wrong with me. And it took a long time for me to be open to the fact that these are real issues and I'm not weak. And more importantly, that I'm not alone. And that this doesn't have to be the rest of my life. Feeling this way towards other people that I don't know or that I do know. Because it's not fair for any of them. I've come to realize that strength comes from facing head on and dealing with these things. Acknowledging it. Not by becoming numb. Not by putting an emotionless face on saying, yeah, I'm fine. Not by checking out. So you're probably wondering, Josh, are you going to therapy? Yes. And I have some books that I work through as well. Some CBT books and some DBT books, those sorts of things. Good breathing exercises. None of this stuff I ever thought I would have to do. Not me. <laughs> Fun fact, when all of that happened, I was really into watching Dr. K for a while, trying to do what I thought was my own version of therapy, because I was too man, uh, macho, to go pay for someone to care about me. That's what I thought. But I remember I, specifically, I was watching Michael Reeves and his interview with Dr. K, and it had me go, huh, I never thought about therapy that way before. Particularly rough patch around when my dad called about a year and a half ago, tried to catch up with me while I was living with HR Lady and her parents, and I just couldn't get over it. And so HR Lady actually emailed Dr. K on my behalf, a healthy gamer, GG. And she said something like, he won't talk to anyone but you. And at the time, that was true. I was so in my head at the time, I never even knew that HR lady did that until we were at the point of, I don't know what to do to help you, Josh. And she just blurted out, I emailed Dr. K explaining who I am and who you are, but his team got back to me, and I know you won't talk to them. You'll only talk to Dr. K. And that was me being a stubborn doofus. <laughs> but I will never forget HR lady doing that for me. I just didn't want to pay someone to care about me, which again now I know is an incorrect viewpoint. You might be wondering, have you spoken to your family since, Josh? What's the update? Um, so for the most part, they, they're cut off. Um, I've only spoken to my mother a handful of times after all this has happened. And that was only because I answered a phone number I didn't know. I had blocked every other number. And from what I can gather, my parents aren't together anymore. I don't know where they live. And I believe my sister has a kid. After about two conversations of opening up that can of worms, and I kept things very surface level, I started getting texts from my mother asking me for tech support for some laptop that they had found. And I think my mother was convinced that my father was hacking her and tracking her and doing all these things, but the entire ordeal just gave me nothing has changed vibes. I decided to text her and say, I'm actually not ready to talk to you anymore. Sometimes I'm okay, and sometimes I'm very, very upset. And that was all I said to her. To this day, I still get calls from her. I should block the number. I know. I just haven't done it yet, but I will. 50% of those calls end in voicemails that are her crying. And the other 50% of those voicemails are her groveling some way. And the other day, one of them was left crying, Josh, I just want to talk to you, Josh. You're my firstborn son, Josh. And then proceeded to say, I don't know why you won't talk to me. I'm sorry for whatever I've done as if because we spoke twice before. Very surface level, everything was forgotten. It's hard to describe, but she leaves a lot of voicemails like this. And it's this sort of thing that ha it has been the hardest for me. When my mother says, I love you, and I miss you, and I care about you, and then she says, it would really make me happy if you called. And there is this small part inside of me that says, don't you want to make your mom happy, Josh? She's your mom. And my brain just reverts back to rose-tinted goggles when everything she said wasn't a lie. 
then I stop myself and come back to reality. Sometimes I wish they spoke a different language because for the longest time, and even to this day, just when someone says, I love you, it's really difficult for me to understand that because they use the same words and people that truly care about me use the same words and I have to just, you know, it's taken a long time to learn. But these days I hear HR Lady say it to me and I know she means it. I hear HR Lady's family say it to me and I know they mean it. But above all else, they show me that they mean it. They act, they commit, they follow through. And if they make a mistake, they apologize and they try to make amends. Since knowing HR Lady and HR Lady's family, not once have they ever pressured me to feel a certain way or accept them or any of that. They've always just welcomed me with open arms unconditionally. So mom, I know that you're watching this because this is the only way to get to see your son now. And I have to say, what you've been doing is selfish. And every time you call me, it destroys me. <laughs> but I've come to realize there's no scenario, mom, in which I pick up the phone and anything positive comes of it. What would I get out of it except amplified nightmares, but now with renewed detail? Like, do you even think about what you calling does to me? Really? Remind yourself who lied, who stole, who manipulated. Then remind yourself who unconditionally gave everything they had to you. I'm 32 now, and I fought tooth and nail to rebuild my sanity, stability, and my ability to trust other people again. People you don't know, mother, have paid the price because of the things you've done to me, literally and figuratively, and you owe them an apology and a thank you. And you should probably ask for their forgiveness too, but none of this will ever happen. I won't let it. I'll protect them. Anything I have to do, I will protect them from you. You need to realize, if I answer your calls, you get what you want. You get to hear your son's voice again. You get to have that connection with me again, with your son. And of course that makes you happy. Keyword here, you. It makes you happy. I gain nothing from the interaction. And all I do is open a can of worms. I'm not going to risk everything I've overcome and all the relationships I've built since then because, as you say, I want to talk to my son. It's such a self-serving request and such a guilt trip. I wish I cared more about what you've had to deal with since all of this, because I'm sure you've had to deal with hardship, or as I like to think about it, the consequences of your actions. But I don't care. And yes, I realize it's not a competition for who hurts more. But if it was, let me assure you that you'd lose. In your head, you remember the same Josh that you took for granted, the Josh that you always thought you would have. Well, that Josh isn't around anymore. And you can thank yourself for that. My interests have changed, my views have changed, and my heart has changed. We aren't the same people anymore. Whatever memories you hold on to that you think make you relevant to my life, I have most likely worked hard to erase. Those good old times to you are now just giant question marks in my mind. I, I sometimes have no idea how to remember my childhood now that I know what type of people you are. To be honest, sometimes my entire childhood feels like a lie, but I don't let myself sit on that too long because to me, I had fun playing video games with my friends and that's how I've chosen to remember it going forward. You know, there are things that I would have loved to share with you, mom. Life accomplishments, huge moments, 
and I used to get bummed out about not being able to share them with you, the family, but now I see it the other way around. Why should you be allowed to know? Why do you deserve a slice of space in my life now? And here's the thing. I don't know the answers to those questions, and that's not my problem. It's sad. I used to think one day, maybe you could meet HR Lady and her family. But as I said before, now I do everything in my power to protect them from you. You haven't been here for the growth. They were. You haven't been here for the change. They were. You haven't been here for the hard times. You know who was. And whose fault is that? I deserve more than a phone call that ends with, I love you, from someone who really doesn't. I deserve more than a groveling voicemail asking me, what have I done? Just tell me what I've done. As if you don't know. I deserve more. As for my dad, I have no idea where you're at or what you're doing. But from the bottom of my heart, I have to say, you're a coward. I used to look up to you. I saw you as a hero, a role model, someone worth loving, someone worth helping, someone whose talents went unrecognized. I trusted you, and I made a fool of myself. For the longest time, all I wanted was your approval, probably like most sons. But I've come to realize you didn't even want kids. You never saw me as your son. I was just the child of unintended consequences from you being in the heat of the moment. And that's how it felt growing up. I mean, that's what you guys told me. I was a shotgun wedding baby. Maybe if you wanted kids, you would have looked in my direction once or twice when I was growing up and asked me what I was up to, but you never did. I wasn't your son. I was just an inconvenience until I became old enough to be useful. I don't have kids, so I can't define what it means to be a good father. But I sure do recognize what it looks like to have a good father. And in that sense, HR Lady's father is the best man I know. A man I can only aspire to be like. And we're both ten times the man you'll ever be. My sister, well, she tried to message me about her kid. I'm not sure who thought that was a good idea, and that's all I have to say about that. Now, on a positive note, I think I'd like to say that I'm cool with my grandma. I think we can chalk it up to we were both mad, and we said really mean, mean things to each other. Um, but I still don't talk with her, and it's most likely better that way. I know that she's probably lonely. And I feel for her. So Grandma, if you're watching, I hope you're doing okay. And I'm sorry it ended up this way. You know, on my 32nd birthday this year, HR Lady took me to see one of my favorite bands, um, Memphis Mayfire. And there's a song titled Blood and Water. And never before have lyrics from a song hit like they did that night. So for those of you watching, if you're into metal and you're going through something similar, maybe give that song a listen. There's one thing left on this topic I'd like to say, and I'd like to direct this to my grandfather, who officially disowned me in the very beginning. It's funny, you know. I really did think that one day 
you'd man up and apologize, even if I didn't answer. You'd do it anyways, because you'd know you have done what's right. Because that's what your book says to do. Maybe you'd write it in a letter if you couldn't say it. Maybe you'd send an email. Maybe you'd send a text, an Instagram message, anything at all. But here we are, years later, and nothing. Just condescending letters that don't acknowledge anything or anyone. Just, hey, life is short. Come visit us. Live a life you don't regret. Even my parents said some basic form of sorry. But you still don't have the balls to do it. And at this point, let's be honest. It's not like it would mean anything. And maybe you know that. Or maybe you really just don't think you've done anything wrong. You can keep going to church and pretend like you get to go to heaven. Maybe Jesus has forgiven you. But I haven't. And I want you to know you're going to have to live with that. So without any communication from you, I'm forced to think a few things here. Maybe you aren't sorry, and you feel like you've done nothing wrong. Maybe you were sorry at first, but after I started making videos about it, and about all the crazy religious stuff that you did, you saw that and that upset you. So now you feel like I'm the one in the wrong, or maybe we're even, or you just don't want to talk to me anymore. Or maybe you're just another coward. Now that I have that out of the way, you've probably noticed over the past year or so I've slowed down posting videos. I haven't posted a video in 22 days at this point. And you might have seen people in the background of my skits or just some of my videos, and I've never addressed who they were or why they are there in my videos. Basically, I realized that I was working as a way to avoid dealing with the internal trauma that I had. Uh, instead of learning to trust and build relationships again, I chose to keep my nose down and just work, and hopefully time would make it go away. I was making videos, I was showing up, I was going through the motions, smile on my face, making jokes, making skits, but I wasn't, I wasn't healing. So that's what I decided to do. Time to start healing. So I started to reach back out to friends that I had when I was younger. Friends that knew me before YouTube. Friends that accepted me for me. Friends that knew me and my family and what had happened between us. I had one friend that invited me to his wedding when I first moved to Utah in 2015. And I didn't go. Now this is a friend that I've known for years. So not only did I not go, I left him on read about whether I would go or not. And at the time, I was torn between taking care of my parents paying their rent while working at a job I hated to earn the right to do the prior. I should have just told my friend no, but I didn't want to disappoint him. So, needless to say, the wedding happened, and I wasn't there, and that created a pretty large void between us, and we spoke very sparsely after that, just occasionally on Discord. That is until one day I reached back out to really, really apologize for being an asshat to him. And after a long conversation, we came to a mutual understanding, and we finally made amends. For the first time in years, we met up and hung out with each other. He came to visit me, and I went to visit him. It was the first time we met in person since 2011. That's when I met his wife and his kids for the first time. Not only was he the same friend that I had back in high school electronics class, but he was now a military man, decorated for his service with an entire life and family he built. And as soon as we saw each other, I gave him a big hug and I said, sorry about everything, man. It had been 10 years at that point. But after, after that, 
It was just right back to making stupid jokes and laughing like we did when we were younger. And it was nice to be able to share memories that I don't have to question. To be able to catch up. It was my first glimpse into remembering what friendship was and what it could be again. So I spent a few weeks with him at his house in Florida. And in that time, we played video games like high school nerds. We rode his two Goldwing motorcycles around town. We kayaked in flooded rivers to classical music and then to DMX because that was our music and weight training class in high school. And in general, we had a really good time together. And I haven't felt that sense of, yeah, dude, life is really good in a long, long time. But beyond just us, we also had some family outings. As you can imagine, his wife wasn't the biggest fan of me since I am the friend that didn't come to their wedding by ghosting them. But after my initial apologies to her as well, everything was fine. His kids were great, they were well behaved and respectful. And in a world where a lot of people my age have kids that they don't raise anymore, it was nice to see my friends spending that time with their children and really raising them. It just makes me wish that I had that, you know? So it was good to see. In the last video I made, you saw my good friend Mike playing the part of the worker. And I actually met Mike a few years ago in my Discord. And I remember the first thing he said in voice chat was something like, Hey, isn't this Discord for some YouTuber named Josh? And that's when I chimed in and said, Yeah, that's the guy who complains about everything, right? The guy who hates corporate and won't shut up about it. And that's before he realized it was me. <laughs> and we both had a laugh. And he told me he was getting into code. And that's how we started talking. We did a couple videos about code. But behind the scenes, we just kept talking. And we actually met the first time when I was filming a video in Texas, and I had asked him to come help me film. And it was quite the introduction between us, since it was a one-bed hotel room. Look, I, I, I know you automatically think YouTubers are, are, are millionaires, but I'm definitely not. <laughs> and I also enjoy a deal. So that's why we got the one-bedroom hotel. But anyways, uh, we put the body pillow between us, and we've been friends ever since. So this past summer, maybe fall you could say, Mike came out and babysit my house and my dogs for a while while I was on my first family trip with HR Lady and her family. And it was the first time I had ever been to Disneyland. It was the first time I had ever been to Las Vegas. It was the first time I had ever gambled. And it was the first of many things, <laughs> if we're being quite honest. It was actually that trip that prompted this video you're watching right now. There was a moment when HR Lady and I and her family and her aunt and brothers and sisters and their boyfriends and we were all together having a great time and, and, and there wasn't a single disagreement the entire time we were there for a week. And everyone was just unapologetically themselves. I don't remember exactly where it was in the park, probably somewhere around Thunder Mountain and New Orleans Square. But there was a moment when I was walking behind the group and I thought to myself, this is family. This is it. These are my people. This is what a family is supposed to be. This is what they meant by that. I've probably read thousands of comments at this point talking about, Josh, just go make your own family. And at the time, I had no idea what that meant or what that looked like. But in my state of mind back then, that was the last thing I ever wanted, was one of those, a family. For the longest time, being with family was like being shoved into a room full of strangers where everyone pretends to enjoy everyone else, but they weren't. Everyone's just judging each other instead. We'd hug when we see each other, but it was out of tradition, not love. I mean, they would say, I love you, and you'd say it back to them, but just because they said it first. And so you just have to reciprocate. I remember thinking, like, why do we have to come here? 
Why? Why? We don't get along. Why? So in my head, family has, has been this thing that you tolerate, something you had to do because holidays exist, because birthdays happened. But over the past few years, I think I've learned what it really means to have a family. It's not blood that ties you. It's not religion that ties you. It's not people telling you what to do or how to live like my family did. It's not a group of people that look like you or have the same genetics as you. Family is a choice, something that you create. And this was echoed thousands of times in the comments. It's something that you protect when you find it, but it's not something you're born into. It's not something that you're assigned to. And I know that there are people out there that need to hear that, because for me it was the hardest thing. You know, they're family, it's blood, they raised you 18 years, blah, 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 you owe them. You don't. For those of you out there that have functioning families that happen to be blood relatives, just realize you're very lucky. Hug your parents, hug your relatives, but don't let their titles alone fool you like they did to me. HR lady and her parents have been nothing but a blessing to me. They've never asked me for anything, but they do ask me if I need anything. They support my decisions and they've been there when I needed them. And so has the rest of her family. And if you haven't realized yet, the unpaid intern, you guessed it. He's part of the family. He's HR lady's brother. And at this point, we're brothers. One thing that hits me every now and then, and it's kind of surreal, is to not know where my family is, what they do, where they live, how they live, or even if they have a roof over their head. I'll just be walking around. Hmm, I have no idea where they're at or what they're doing. It's a very strange experience. I know I won't inherit anything, especially not at this point, nor will I ever be able to see old pictures or videos of myself or my family just to show to other people, which is pretty weird to think about. No home videos, no pictures, no knickknacks, relics, toys, nothing. I did have one envelope with pictures of myself as a child and my parents, and I burned it. I threw it in a fire, and I stood next to HR lady and her family, thanking them for everything they've done for me. And I said, you guys are my family now. I've just had a pretty large perspective shift lately, and I think after having spent some time in a happier place in life, a place where most people already are, I'm less jaded and I'm less cynical than I was before, and it has allowed me to be more carefree and enjoy life. I'm sure I'll make some more content on corporate, or maybe it'll be a different way of doing it, but either way, thank you for sticking through it with me. And I know I'm not alone.